soul winning, practical. So it's what you put into practice. Now, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, some of these things, they're not, it's not gospel. Okay, so some of the things that we're going to be talking about today is more of a matter of preference than hard, fast rule or this is absolutely 100% right and no one else can do it another way. But what I'd like to have is unity within the church on, on how we go out and, and give the gospel. There's a lot of things that I'm going to be teaching on that maybe you hadn't thought about before when, you, when you're you know, going from door to door. And I'm really going to try to get very detailed on, on all the specifics that go along with just going out and preaching the gospel and how we ought to be doing that. So um, some of them are, are, I believe, are non-negotiable. I mean, it's true. It is what it is. But other things, they're going to be, you know, if you're, if you're not like 100%, like, I don't know, Pastor Brother, if that's right. A lot of this stuff isn't necessarily going to be, you know, that big of a deal. But we need to do things a certain way. I'm going to instruct and teach on how we go out and knock on doors. And just to give you an understanding, there's already been a couple questions on certain situations. So I'm going to try to answer some of those as well as anything else that hasn't come up already. And um, I, I want to start by just having you think and just understand this. And, and every time we're looking at how we do things, one, what does the Bible say? Right? But two, the Bible doesn't always give you the, the very nitty-gritty details on every single thing. But the Bible gives you principles. Right? And that's what we're using to make our decisions. So I've got scriptures that we're going to be looking at and where we get principles from, as well as the, the explicit, you know, this is what was done or this is what we should do. But one of the things that we always need to remind ourselves of is what is the goal of soul winning? What's the goal? What's the end game? Well, the goal is to get people saved. That's our goal. And you'll probably do pretty well as long as we keep that in mind. When we go out to a door, what is the purpose? We want people to get saved. It isn't just, it isn't, we're not going out with the sole purpose of recruiting people to church. Now, it would be a good thing for people to come to church. I wouldn't be upset if people came to church, but that's not the goal of why we go out at a soul winning time. It's to win souls to Christ. So keep that in mind as we go through these things. Now, the first thing that we do, and I'm always going to try to do this, and I think we have successfully, but if there's a time where it doesn't happen, is we want to start off our soul winning with prayer. And you cannot pray enough. And I won't, and, and you know, I'll stress that, that even though, you know, because oftentimes we're sending people out because we have so many groups, we might go to different areas and stuff. I like to have a group prayer here we're all involved with. Because we know that in our own flesh, of our own ability, of our own talents, we can do nothing. We need to be yoking up and working with the Holy Spirit in order for people's souls to get saved. We're just a vessel. You know, we didn't die for these people. Jesus Christ did. Now, don't get me the wrong way. I don't, I, I still believe it's completely biblical in the terminology of, you know, we got somebody saved or I got this person saved. There's nothing wrong with that language. We see the Apostle Paul uses that language quite frequently. You know, I become all things, all men, that I might by all means save some. He's talking about winning their souls to Christ. And, and over and over, I could go through, I'm not even going to go into all the scripture that just shows that that is totally a biblical concept to say that. But that being said, we also know and believe fully that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the one who, who paid for all the sins, and we can do nothing without him. So we go out, we work, we want the Holy Spirit, we want Jesus with us, we want the, the, the blessing of God upon us, so we are going to pray Every time. And, you know, sometimes, even though you pray once before we go, you can pray with your partner before you get started on those doors. And I've even prayed, just stopped in the middle of sowing. Sowing's not going that well. You know what? I'm just going to get on my knees and pray. Or just stop here and pray. And we're just going to pray, God, you know, like things aren't going real well, God. God, lead us somewhere. Lead it, you know, have someone cross our path or whatever. Because, look, it, that is totally according to God's will. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you're there bringing the information and you've got the word of God and you're there to, to show people why they need to repent, why they need to change their mind and put their faith in Jesus Christ, 
then there's no reason why God's not going to answer that prayer as much as he will. I mean, the only thing that God won't do is he can't decide for somebody and make people believe. But he could give them great opportunities. So we pray. Praying is number one. I don't think I'm going to get any objections to that on how we do things here. Yes, we're going to be praying to God every time. The second point, we started off here in Mark chapter 6. And these are in no particular order. Okay, just I wrote down a bunch of different things on, on how we practice soul winning and what we do here. Um, just to try to explain every point. In Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus Christ sending out the twelve in verse number seven. It says, and He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two. And it goes on, it says, gave them power of unclean spirits and commanded them they should take nothing for the journey. And it goes on and on. But the point that we see here, the, the example that we have in Scripture, we don't have a command that says you must go soul winning with a soul winning partner and this is the way that God says it has to be done. We don't see that as a command in Scripture. But we see an example of Jesus Christ sending out his disciples in pairs, in pairs of two. And we can see a lot of good and, and understand a lot of good reasons as to why this is a good idea to have, too. But it's not a hard, fast rule. Now, when we make groups here, we are going to be sending people forth by two and two in general as the example set forth to follow. It's a good example. That's what Jesus did. If it's good enough for him to, to send his disciples out that way, then that's what we, we're going to do it. But there's obviously going to be some times, what do you do when you have an odd number of people? Well, you just can't go soul winning then. No. It, that's why it's not some hard, fast rule. It's not, it's not some hard, fast thing. So I'm very flexible with that. I mean, I'm used to going out soul winning by myself for quite a bit. And, and you know what? Many of you probably have too. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I'm not saying not to go out soul winning. If you don't have a partner, if you have no one else to go with, to go out just, I mean, hey, knock on doors, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing. But ideally, what we're going to try to do is pair people up. And I'm not going to go into the, all of the reasons why having a silent partner is important, but it is. That's kind of a sermon for another day in and of itself. Uh, just real briefly, having two people there is great for um, being able to stop distractions. You're going to be a lot more effective having someone else there kind of praying that, that God's going to open up the heart of the person that, that the other one's talking to. Um, there's so many different situations can come up. Maybe one of you knows how to speak another language, the other one doesn't. There's a lot of different reasons why you can have uh, a benefit to having two people. But even without understanding all those reasons, we see that Jesus did it. It's a good example. It's a biblical example. It's something that we do here. It's something we practice here. Now, when I pair people up, the goal also in what we're doing here is try to get people that don't know how to give the gospel, they're not comfortable with it, an opportunity to be able to give the gospel to somebody. So we start off by pairing people into groups of, well, hey, if you're comfortable doing this, you know how to do it, we're going to match you up with someone who doesn't know how to give the gospel so that they could learn firsthand. Hands-on experience is the best experience to have. You, can, you, you learn so much by doing, oftentimes, than just studying. So if there's any, I don't know if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't do the talking yet, but um, you know, don't wait to get started doing the talking would be my advice. You don't have to memorize and just study, 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 study. Now, hey, studying is great. Study the Bible. But don't let that hold you back from actually doing the talking. Because we need to, uh, you know, the, you're going to learn so much more by doing. I know for the longest time I was Pastor Anderson's silent partner. And that was a little intimidating. And, and I remember it. Because I, I didn't want to do the talking. And, I, and more importantly, though, I didn't want to screw things up. It's him and I going out soul winning, and I'm just like, you know what? If I try to do this, I'm not nearly as good at explaining as he is. I'm just going to let him do it. He could do the talking because, you know, every time I'm thinking, well, I want this person to get saved. That's why we're going out soul winning. The problem with that mentality, though, is that then I'm never going to be a talker. I'm never going to do it. And then what's going to happen when someone else shows up or when Pastor Anderson isn't there or anything? You know, I can't just rely on someone else. It's way more valuable it's way more valuable in the long run to do, start doing the talking 
right away, even if someone else can do a better job than you, that doesn't matter. You start getting that experience. You start making, instead of just having one person able to give the gospel, two, three, four, you start adding those numbers up, you're going to be that much more effective and end up doing that much more. I mean, do you, do you think I'm still thinking the same way if I were to go out solo with Pastor Anderson that I'd be like, well, I shouldn't do any of the talking because, I mean, he's just way better than I am at it and, and there's like, I would, I would just don't think that, that I can get someone saved. I, I just want him to do it. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Of course not. And I don't feel about that w way with anybody here that, you know, that, that I've been with that I know I just do, do a good job out soul winning. Like, I wouldn't feel like, um, I wouldn't feel any problem saying, no, you do the talking. Right? You just, just switch because you're a soul winner. It's, it's not that, you know, ultimately, I mean, it's a big deal someone's soul, but it's not, it's not like it's um, any one person has to do it. So we send people out by two and two. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because we're getting another very solid principle that we're actually be using for a lot of points coming up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians five, verse number seventeen. We're going to see the you know a very solid principle in what we are actually doing when we go out soul winning, and why it's so important, and and kind of the role that we're taking when we go out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, verse number seventeen, the Bible says, "Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away; behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ." and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God." For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This passage is stating here that, of course, if you're saved, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature, old things are passed away, all things have become new. Why? Because all things, because we've been reconciled unto God, which means our sins have been forgiven, we've been pardoned. We, we have, when we sin with, against God, as an unbeliever, when you sin against God, you've got a problem with God. Because you have a debt that you owe. You deserve a punishment. But once you put your faith in Christ, that debt is wiped, wiped away clean. You've now been brought back into good standing with God and good graces with God. You're reconciled unto Him. And the Bible is saying in this passage here, well, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. When Christ was walking around this earth, He was going around and preaching the gospel. And people were getting saved by the power of God through Jesus Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. But now he says these committed unto us that same word of reconciliation. And now since Jesus Christ isn't walking around on this earth as he did for his short ministry while he was on this earth, he says we're here in his place. That's what I mean. It says in his stead. We are here to do the job that he wants us to do as a representative, as an ambassador for Christ. So since Christ can't make it here, we are here to speak for him. We are here to, to bring that word of reconciliation to people so that other people can be reconciled to God, so that other people's sins can be remitted, can be forgiven through Jesus Christ and what he did for them. Now, the reason why I'm going in depth on this is because it's telling us here in verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As a soul winner, as someone who's preaching the gospel, you are an ambassador. You're a representative for Jesus Christ. And this is going to affect a lot of the, the rest of what we're going to get into on how we go soul winning when we have the mindset and we can keep in mind the principle that we are representing Jesus Christ. So when we go out soul winning, this isn't something that's just taken flippantly, right? 
It's not a joke. We take it seriously. And we want to do the best that we can because if you're a representative for someone, that person's going to be your boss, right? Jesus Christ is our boss and we're representing him. We're going out to that person's door and, I mean, think about it. If you were a soul winning partner with Jesus Christ, you'd be like, well, of course, he's going to take every door because he's going to do a way better job than any of us can ever possibly do. I want him to do all the talking. But what Jesus is saying, he's like, you know what, I'm not on this earth right now, so you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to step up and do it. And what we need to do is to be like, okay, well, he's put this job on me. What type of job would he do? How can I best represent him? That's going to be the, the, that's going to be the way you're going to be the best ambassador. That's how Jesus would handle things. So we have to look to the Bible and Scripture for how we deal with, with everything. Now, the first main point here that I have, I'm, I'm trying to like group some things together, is to not give offense. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we go out and preach the gospel, you know, the gospel may offend some people. Some people will get angry because you're at their door or because you bring up the name of Jesus Christ. There are some people out there that hate God and don't want to have anything to do with it. And they'll be offended that you're there. But that's the job you have to do. So if someone gets offended for that reason, that's on them. But when I'm talking about giving none offense, we don't want to go and just be offensive to someone for no reason. So if they don't like the message and that's what offends them is just God's word, there's nothing you can do about that. But there is something you can do if you just go and you kind of have a bad attitude about it, you're not going around things the right way, and you're saying things in a way that's not very tactful, and you're just causing an offense where there doesn't need to be one. Let's read the scripture real quick, and I'll get into that a little bit more. The Bible says in verse number 32 of 1 Corinthians 10, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So in the context here, what we're reading, he's talking about the purpose of me not giving offense. He's like, look, I'm trying to be pleasing to as many people as possible. I'm not trying to cause problems and cause a rift and just get people angry and get them all upset. Because I just want them to get saved. I just want the, big, the most profit to come out of this. So if there's something that you can do at someone's door that's going to set them off and make them angry, we don't want to do that. We don't want people angry with us before you even get a chance to let them get angry at the message, right? Because that would be justified if they get angry at the message. If that offends them, so be it. But we don't want to set them off. We want to do everything we can to try to get people to listen, to try to get them to hear the gospel and not put them in a bad mood. So one of the ways that we do that is we need to be courteous and respectful when we deal with people. A problem that people have when they start to learn a lot of Scripture and learn a lot about the Bible is sometimes they have a tendency to get haughty and lifted up in pride and start to get arrogant and become a jerk. Because the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You could learn and study and listen to all these sermons and then feel like you know so much. But when you don't have the charity and the caring and the love in your heart for the other person, it's going to change the way that you talk to them. For example, you knock on someone's door and you, want, you start to try to give them the gospel and you say, well, have you heard what Jesus did? You know, do you know who Jesus is? You don't know who Jesus is? And you start talking to him like, like, how could you possibly not know this? And you start to lift yourself up, you know, whatever the case may be. Or you ask someone, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Well, how do you know? Well, you have to repent of your sins. <laughs> repent of your sins don't you know that that's work salvation and just you know you don't go off on people like that now obviously I'm kind of making it a, a you know a lot more exaggerated than maybe would really happen but I want you to consider some of the, your responses to people and the way you interact with people so that you don't even subtly come across as being a jerk as being this this proud pompous person 
coming to their door and, and you know, because your goal is to preach them the gospel, we're, we're going forth with meekness and humility, not with some attitude, not with just someone who's, who's lifted up with pride. We want to be courteous. We want to be respectful for them. And sometimes even the littlest things can be perceived as being disrespectful. One example is even just how you knock on the door. Okay? When you go to a door, and, and I know some of this stuff may seem really stupid simple, but I just want to cover it all. Okay? Because a lot of well-meaning people may be making mistakes. And I don't know, because I, don't, I haven't had a chance to go out soul with everybody individually. Or maybe something will happen in the future. I don't know. I'm just going to preach this now and just let's just try to put as much things I can think of on the table because I've seen just about all of this anyways and all from well-meaning people that just want to get people saved. So let's be the best ambassadors that we can be. Being a good ambassador of Jesus Christ is going to start by not going, bum, 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 you know, like you're, like you're someone that, that, you know, they owe a debt or something. Or you're the cops trying to beat down the door, Right? Again, I'm going to be a little extreme in some of these examples, but just to get the point across, we need to knock on the door hard enough for people to hear, right? Don't, don't do one of these. Oh, they're not home. Let's go. You know, <laughs> no one can even hear it, right? Don't be timid and, and scared to knock on the door. Just give a solid, normal knock. Also, we want to give the person time to get to the door. Now, these situations, you're going to have to kind of just learn some of this by experience. But I know where I, where, when I was soul winning in Prescott Valley, there was a lot of people who were a little bit older, and it would take them longer to get to the door. They heard you the first time. And many times, if you, you start just... It's going to irritate someone who's already on their way. It's like, all right, look, I'm coming already. I heard you the first time. We don't want to do that. We don't want to send them off. We're ringing their doorbell. I think a pretty safe way to do one of the ways that I do is if they have a doorbell, I'll ring the doorbell first. And usually I try to listen to see if it even goes off. Because usually you could hear. You can't always hear. And then if they don't come to the door, give them a little bit of time, then I'll try knocking on the door. So that way they get both. A doorbell, a knock. If you don't want to do the doorbell, knock, and then a second knock. But at that, that should be enough. And again, it's, I, I don't have a, a time, like I don't want you going 15 seconds, okay, you know, like there's no, there's no actual time. When you go to an apartment where there's less square footage and less space, it should, you know, people should be able to get to the door probably a little bit quicker than if they're in a bigger house, whatever. Use that at your discretion, but I just need to bring it up so that we're conscious that we're not trying to, you know, irritate people by just, you know, maybe you're excited, man, come to the door, come to the door, but like, Give them a little bit of time to get to the door, right? Uh, another thing that might set people off in, in regards to just not being very courteous or respectful of the person you're at is we shouldn't be walking through their yards. And I've seen this happen a lot. And this is one of the things that, that and I'm not saying I've seen it a lot here. I've just seen it in general. And, and when we go soul winning, you're representing the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're also representing Stronghold Baptist Church. When you go out inviting people to our church, you're representing our church, you're representing Jesus, and we want to do things properly and decently. And you know what? A lot of people get irritated when they see someone just walking through their front yard, just walking through their property or walking by their front window, right? It could be seen as being disrespectful. Now, not everybody cares about that. Maybe you don't care about that if it was your house. But I'm telling you, a lot of people do care about that. So when we go door to door, when you're done knocking on one door, what we ought to be doing is going down the driveway to the sidewalk or to the street, walking over to the next place and going back up their driveway and walking in, in areas as much as is possible that are designed for walking. Okay, again, very simple stuff but very easy to overlook. Now, obviously, there's situations where you might have two driveways kind of next to each other and it's this little tiny stretch of grass or something. Okay, use your discretion. If you think it looks like someone might be irritated by it, by doing it, don't do it. Okay, because we love these people. We want them to get saved. We don't want them angry with us before we even come to the door because they're looking out the window and they see you doing something that they don't like. 
They're going to think you're a jerk right off the bat. And then they're not going to want to listen to what you have to say. The goal is to win souls. Even if you think it's something stupid, who cares? If you think someone shouldn't get offended by that, it doesn't matter. If they're going to get offended by it, then why would you do it? We need to speak to people and to answer the door with respect. Be polite. Again, this should go without saying. We want to allow the other person to speak. We shouldn't always be just trying to, to talk people down and talk over them. When you're giving the gospel to someone, if you want them to, to actually be receptive and hear what you have to say, you should be having a conversation. You're preaching the gospel, yes, but you need to engage that person. You came to their door. A lot of people get upset if you, you, know, you go to someone's house, they open up the door and they, they, you just get talked at and you don't have an opportunity to talk and every time you try to say something, you're just being shut down and cut off. That's not going to be a very effective way of soul winning either. Hear their question. Now, you may have to divert so that you're not going off on, on rabbit trails, but use tact, right? If someone asks you, well, what about, the, and they bring up something stupid, right? Or, or something that's just not very relevant to the gospel. It may not even be something stupid. It's just, it's just not very relevant. I thought the Bible said that, you know, doesn't Jesus have kids or, you know, whatever. Don't just start going off on a lot. Now, that one might be important just because, you're, you know, you got to explain who Jesus is anyways and, you know, he's a deity and, and everything else. But, you know, there's so many different questions people could ask. Let them ask the question. And then, you know, tactfully say, well, hey, can we get back to that in just a little bit? I, wanna, I, I wanted to kind of spend a little bit more time on this, what we started talking about and continue on. And don't talk down to people. Again, this goes back to the, the attitude and the mindset of not being lifted up with pride. There's a lot of people who are going to be ignorant of a lot of things. And I don't care if they start getting an attitude with you. Maybe they're very proud. Maybe they're very arrogant. When you're dealing with someone like that, your flesh is going to want to, oh yeah? You don't want to bring them down a notch. But that's not going to be an effective way to go soul winning. It's not. Now, maybe if they're too lifted up with pride, they're not going to be ready to, to get saved anyways. However, however, it may not happen that day. But the way that you carry yourself, the way that you represent Jesus Christ can go a long way maybe further down the road. Maybe that person today isn't at the place in their heart because they're proud to receive Christ. But then later on, weeks, years, who knows, something might happen in their life where they start reevaluating their situation. Now, if you deal with them meekly and humbly, they might look back on that situation because it has something to do with their eternal fate. And they're, you know, they're starting to think about it now and say, wow. They might even go back and think, wow, I was a real jerk to that guy. It might be way more open then to now wanting to hear what is it that he had to say. I don't know. And maybe, you know, and, and, and have a better attitude towards it as opposed to, hey, this guy came to my door and all I remember is that he was being a jerk, you know, because he, you know, he kept on trying to talk down to me or whatever. The th our, our actions can carry a long weight is, is a point I'm trying to get across. And, and, you know, regardless of how someone else is being to you, you know, when Jesus reviled, he reviled not again. When he was beaten, he didn't threaten. You know, he, he, he had all these things happen unto him. And we're supposed to be representing Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be his ambassadors. So, you know, we don't need to get caught up in this fleshly game of... of going back and forth and getting involved in these arguments or just talking down to people. No one's going to like that. Also, we don't want to try to cram the gospel down people's throat. If someone says they're not interested, the first thing that I do, okay, have a good day. See you later. You know, I'll give them the card or whatever and, 
you want to give them a YouTube card or whatever, fine. Like, but when, when, when they're expressing, they're not interested. And you know, you could read people. Sometimes people say they're not really interested, but like they've really got nothing going on and they might listen to you anyways. Okay, but there's some people just like, yeah, I'm not interested. Nope, sorry, thanks. And you know, say it like twice. We need to take the hint and move on. Because not only are we representing Christ, but we, you know, which Christ isn't going to cram it down anyone's throat either. You never see him doing that in the Bible. But we also don't want to waste our time. Because someone's going to want to listen to you. You guaranteed. That person wants to say, okay, fine. Don't listen to me. I'll go talk to someone else. You don't want to waste any more time than you have to with people who are uninterested. Um, and then turn if you want to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But also, as far as being courteous and being respectful as an ambassador for Christ, you know, I mentioned this before. I'm trying to make it a goal. I want to go out, I want to go out sewing with everybody in a church individually. I want to go out personally with everybody in this church. And um, you know, I say I want to go out with the talkers, but it's not just the talkers, it's everybody. Um, I want to get a chance to, to know everyone in this church, and usually when you go out soul winning, it's a good time to do it. There's a lot of time in between doors. You kind of talk to people, you know, get to know each other pretty well. That being said, we want to be very discreet in our conversations as well. So, you know, again, what's the reason we go out soul winning? It's not to fellowship. That's not the main reason why we're going out. It is to get people saved. When you go and you're talking with people, you're having a conversation, maybe you're talking about something that's really interesting you're real passionate about. I don't know about you, but when I'm passionate about things, I tend to raise my voice a little bit. You get excited about stuff. You want to keep this in check when you're out soul-winning with somebody because you don't want to be standing at someone's door and you're just engaged, you're so interested and involved in the conversation that you're having you're not even realizing there's someone coming to the door and opening up. You want to be as involved in this big conversation at someone's door. You know what? That's kind of rude. You're showing up to their house and now you're having a conversation with your buddy and it's like, oh, hey, I'm here. What do you need? What do you want? Right? Or maybe they just come to the door and they're trying to see who it even is and you guys are just out there talking and you have this loud conversation going and they're just like, who is this coming up to my door and just having this loud conversation on my front porch? Right? But these are things that can easily happen when you're not kind of paying attention about it and thinking about, hey, what are we really here for? I'm not saying you can't have conversations. But just like John and I were out soul winning and we, and we were talking between doors, but you know what? It was really at a low level. Both of us. I mean, we were, we were talking. It was pretty hushed. I mean, it was, we would talk a while. And then we, if we see someone's coming to the door and we stop talking. You know, someone's looking out the window. You can hear someone by the door. You stop. Why? Because your focus and your intent is I, I'm going to focus and give all my attention to this person here at the door because I care about them. That's why we're here. You talk fine between the doors and stuff. You get up to the door. You start getting a lot more quiet and, and just keep it on a good level. Again, very practical stuff. Hopefully very, you know, very simple stuff. But we're learning this stuff from principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to start reading verse number 16. The Bible says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men... Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. That's an important statement, and we're going to read. He's going to, he's going to explain this more thoroughly, but he's saying, look, I'm free from all men. He's not under bond. He's not under slavery to anybody, right? I'm free. No one has any control over me, any say over me. I'm free from all men. Though I be free from all men, he says, yet have I made myself servant unto all. He said, even though I'm free, I'm going to be a minister. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to go and serve other people. I'm going to be a servant to everybody because I want to gain more people to Christ. Verse number 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. 
to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Again, this is a language I was just talking about. He's using. He's talking about saving people. I want to get people saved. So I'm going to do whatever I can to get them saved. And one of the ways that people are going to listen to what you have to say is if they feel like they could relate to you. You have something in common. It's a great way. We, we were, um, it just happened today. Where John and I were out soul winning and, and John was at the door. He's doing the talking. We, we met a gentleman and he was from Morocco. And he brought up an experience that he had. He's like, oh, hey, you know, because he didn't want to talk to us. He's like, oh, yeah, no thanks. He's like, yeah, my roommate goes to church. Yeah, okay, you know, and it was kind of like just, just not really wanting much to do, but he was real friendly and nice about it. He wasn't just being adamant like, no, I'm not interested in closing the door, you know. It, it wasn't one of those. But he was just kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm not really interested. Yeah, my roommate goes to church and stuff. And she kind of tells me about it. And, you know, he's a little bit talkative, but... When, when we asked him where he's from, he said, you know, he said he's Morocco, and, and that gave John an opportunity to say, oh, yeah, hey, I spent some time in that area. Oh, I spent some time, you know, and, and that, that actually got him to a point to want to listen to us a little bit more. And we actually got more opportunity then to give him more verses. Now, he still ultimately didn't listen to the full plan of salvation, but we got a lot more verses out as a result of that. And that's just one example. I mean, it happened literally today. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what, what he's talking about here. You know, we want to, you know, as much as is possible. Now, granted, with someone at the door, there's, there's a lot of things you don't know about that person, right? And also, people don't want you just beating around the bush when you show up at their door, right? Most people want to know, why are you there? So don't take this the wrong way. Again, we, this all requires a little bit of wisdom. Not a lot, just a little bit of wisdom. You don't, our approach isn't going to be to go and just try to make friends with every single door, you know, every person that comes every single door in order to try to get an opportunity to preach them the gospel. That's not what we're saying, right? We're going to be direct. We're going to tell everyone because we don't want them getting irritated with us. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll never tell you where they're from. They just want to talk about everything else before you finally get it out of them. Are you Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah, yeah, we're, you know, get out of here. So you want to talk about everything else. It's irritating. We don't want to do that. We're not there to irritate people. Whether they know that or not, we're not there to irritate them. Just tell them right off the bat, hey, we're visiting from a Baptist church, strong old Baptist church, you know, we just want to invite you to church. Now they know why you're there. But now you can also use anything else that comes up. If someone in, in conversation, they're, you know, you want, to, you want to relate to them as much as possible. You want to build that connection. You want to become all things to all people that might by all means save some. Now, obviously, there's boundaries to this. He was talking about, what about Paul was talking about the Jews? He's like, yeah, hey, I became like a Jew. Like, you know, people are under the law. You know, I, I started relating to them about their, you know, being under the law. While he's explaining that that's not going to save you. He's still relating to them about that. And then he says to those that are without law, as without law. He's, he's, he's relating to them as well, but he's still saying, well, but I'm not going to, you know, there's still a law that I'm following to Christ. I'm not going to disobey Christ just to try to be like these people. As the, the lifestyle evangelism people try to tell you, oh yeah, just go ahead, you know, you got to be all things, all people. So that means you got to go in the bar and have a drink with your buddy, then go ahead and do it. No, that's stupidity. It's foolishness. We're not going to go and break God's commandments in order just to become all things, all people. No, you're still under the law to Christ. You're not going to just sin in order to try to bring people to Christ. It's counterproductive. It's not going to work. But you can still relate to people. Someone brings up just a bunch of things, being without law. Maybe you have a pastor. Maybe you know someone, you know, whatever. You, could, you can relate to them but you're not going to get involved in, in that, uh, you know, in their lawlessness. Uh, you know, in any case, verse number 23 here says, and this I do for the gospel's sake. Yeah, it is very pertinent to preaching the gospel. I do this for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. I'm doing all these things. Why? Because I want people to get saved. I want people to hear the gospel. And that's what we want. That's the whole goal. 
We're trying to get people saved. We're trying to win people to Christ. So we're going to do everything that we possibly can. We're going to be courteous. We're going to be respectful. We'll be that, remember that we're ambassadors for Christ. So we're not going to try to irritate people doing anything unless it's just strictly through the Word of God. But even when we give people the Word of God, we're going to try to do so in a way that we hope isn't going to irritate them. I'll give you an example of this. I, I was speaking with a holiness Pentecostal person last week. Now, people who are very religious, I know that they will get offended if you tell them, I don't think you're saved. So that is not the best way to start a conversation. Now, I'll tell you this. I ended the conversation by telling her, I don't think you're saved. And she got offended. And that ended the conversation. But it was appropriate. And it needed to be said because it was, it was true. And I can't leave someone thinking that they're just fine thinking that they're saved. But had I started the conversation off that way, I never would have gotten anywhere. But see, I was able to actually give her the gospel, explain eternal security, show her the Bible verses, let her think about that first before finally getting to the point to where it had to be done because she wasn't receiving this because of too much pride, which is the problem with most holiness people is they actually think that they're living these perfect lives. They actually believe that you could live this sinless perfect, perfection life. Now, I, I want to start off being very tactful and polite. And you know what? Even when I told her that, I wasn't rude or condescending about it. She got offended anyways, but I didn't just say, oh, you're just going to split hell wide open anyways, lady. I say, look, I, I even preface it with saying, I'm not here to try to offend you about this, but here's what the Bible says. And according to Scripture, you don't believe it's eternal life and you're not believing the record that God gave of His Son and this is what you have to believe in order to be saved. So I don't think you're saved because you're not believing it's eternal life. If you think you could lose it, then it's not eternal. You know, the, the, I didn't use those exact words. It was something similar to that, right? I mean, that's, that's a way that you can explain to someone that this is why. But you don't want to start off just being offensive to people, especially knowingly. You know something's going to set someone off. You know, you, there's no reason to do that. We're not, we're not there to just to upset people and offend them. Now, if the truth offends them, that's on them. But if you can get the gospel out there and try to get them to hear and try to reach them, because if, if I could have reached that lady with the truth, I don't have to tell her that she's unsaved if she realizes that, what I'm, that, that the gospel is right, that this is true. She'll come up to that conclusion on her own. She won't need me to tell her that she was unsaved if she actually can hear the gospel and realize, yeah, that's actually right. That's true. And you believe that, you'll, you know right away that what you believed before was wrong. The next point I want to make in regards to just, you know, again, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ is that we want to be presentable ourselves. When we go to the door, we want to if you're going to be the best ambassador you can be, you ought to go to the door at being presentable in your appearance as much as possible. Now, I'm not saying you have to wear a shirt and a tie and a suit or anything like that to, in order to go soul winning, because you don't. You could preach the gospel wearing whatever you want to wear. But I'll tell you this much. Again, even from personal experience, people will listen to you more and give you a lot more respect and want to hear what you have to say if you're dressed well as opposed to not dressed well. They don't, you, don't have a ten, you have a tendency not to take people nearly as seriously. If I were to show up to your door wearing ripped jeans, tie-dyed shirt, wearing some beads, and I go, hey man, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Even just the manner of speech that I use Are you really going to want to listen to what I have to say? Even if it's all true, you're going to look at me and you're going to judge and you're going to say, no. 
get off my porch. Right? Again, it's an extreme example, right? And I'm not seeing anyone do it. Now, I would rather have somebody doing that, that's saved, than doing nothing at all. Because maybe someone will listen. Maybe you can reach somebody, right? I mean, maybe you could go to the, to the, to the crowd, to, to the college campus where there's a bunch of people that all hang out that are, that are dressed like that, whatever, right? You could become all things to those people and start over there with that crowd. Great. Okay, but by and large, even people in that crowd, when you see someone dressed nice and dressed appropriately, you're gonna, they're going to give you respect. It's just the way that people are. And when people are going to give you respect, they're going to listen to what you have to say. This, these are tips. Am I saying there's a dress code to go out soul winning? No, I'm not. But if you want to be the best ambassador that you can be, and you want to reach the, the maximum number of people you possibly can, I'm going to say be presentable. Be presentable in the way that you look, not just your clothing, the way that your, your haircut and everything. Just be well kept. Be, you know, don't, don't go out looking like a slob. Okay? Be clean. Speak in, in a way that's going to sound intelligible and intelligent as opposed to just all kinds of slang and just, just nonsense language. The goal is to reach people. And if you think that's petty and if you think they shouldn't judge, fine. Maybe you're even right, but that's not going to help them, their soul get saved just because you think that they're wrong for that. Just like when the Bible teaches about people, you know, the weak Christian, the weak believer that thinks that you can't eat meat and there's some vegetarian, you know, the Bible says, look, we don't need to offend that person. They're weak in the faith. We're still going to support them and love them. You know, let's not cause a problem or an area to offend them, even if they're wrong. So what? Maybe they are wrong about that. And in that case, they are wrong. But we're not going to make that some big issue to, to cause them to offend. And it's the same thing when we go out to the door. We're trying not to be offensive in whatever, even if, it's, even if you think it might be silly. In a similar fashion with, the, you know, with your own personal appearance, when we go out with our materials, whether you have invitations or tracks or something like that, try not to ruin them. Try not to, to, to fold them up and wrinkle them and, and things like that. Because, again, you, you're giving off an impression, especially if they're not home, you're not going to want to read something that just looks off the bat like a piece of junk. Like there's a piece of trash, this is a piece of paper that blew off the street into your, into your porch. You're going to throw it in the trash. You're not even going to look at it. Right? If you want people to look at it, you know, place it in an area that's going to be highly visible. Place it in an area that they're not going to have to get up on a ladder to try to reach it. Right? To irritate them. Just, oh man, I can't believe these people put this thing up here. Try to keep these things in good shape. You know, you keep them in your car or whatever. Try to keep them in good shape because if you're giving them to people, you don't want to give them something that just looks like you don't care about it at all. Because that's going to, whether, whether you understand it or not, believe it or not, that it's going to come across as, well, if they don't even care about this, why should I care about what they're trying, to, you know, about their church or what they're trying to give me? They obviously don't really care that much to keep these things in good condition. And it's, it's just a message that's even subliminally will just kind of go across. Now, does that mean someone can't get saved if you're using a, a, a wrinkled invitation? No, no. But we're trying to be the best that we possibly can. That's why I'm bringing up all these little things. It's kind of a, a lot of little details, but all together aggregate, they, they can be important. They could actually have a, somewhat of an impact here. Um, turn if you go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, when we go out soul winning again, we want to win souls. We don't want to win arguments. You can win arguments all day long and win zero souls to Christ. It's called a debate, first of all. You ever watch a debate between a Christian and anybody else that's a non-believer? You know who usually wins those debates? Christians. Why? Because they have the truth. Because if you're saying that there's a God against someone who's saying there's not a God, the Christian wins every time. The, the, the believer is going to win because they're right. But you know what never, never happens? Is the person on the other side never gets saved. Because they're not preaching the gospel. They're just debating them. They're just, they're just arguing. They may be right. They may win the argument, but who cares? 
And this is this is very important. Like I remember, I know, I know for a fact that especially if you're newer at soul winning, this is going to be a common area that that's a pitfall. I've done my fair share of arguing, and I'm not, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it, even though it wasn't the best thing to do, it wasn't the best use of time. I understand the excitement. I understand what it's like to just to, to start to know all this stuff about the Bible and to be zealous and like you run across that Jehovah's Witness that maybe maybe some Jehovah's Witness at one time put you to shame because you didn't have an answer for him, you didn't know him. And then you run across the guy like, oh man, I've learned so much more now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run circles around you with the gospel, with the scripture. I can, you know, you're going to end up wasting your time. You know, waste your whole time and then someone else that was down the street that just happened to be home at that time or maybe visiting a relative that's going to be going away and you, the next week when you come back to that area isn't going to be there anymore. And you missed them because you wasted your time just arguing and winning an argument instead of winning a soul. Titus chapter 3, verse number 9, the Bible says, but avoid foolish questions. What's a foolish question going to do? It's going to waste your time. That's why you avoid them. Foolish question is, is no meaning in even answering, no, no purpose to just giving them the, the, your time to answer. Avoid those things. Avoid the foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. This is also why, you know, people freak out when they hear, the, you know, uh, the people that hate God or the people that, that hear the preaching against the sodomites and things like that, freak out when they hear we go door to door as if we're like going door to door going, hey, did you know homosexuality is punished by the death penalty in the Bible? Hey, did you know that sodomites are supposed to be put to death? Like, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's not what we're doing at all. And it's not what you should be doing. We don't, we don't come up with, you know, try to make strivings about God's law and just fight with people over this and over that about God's law because it's, it's going to be unprofitable and vain. It doesn't mean anything. We're not there for that. We're there to win souls. They're unprofitable and vain. Verse number 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. If you run across someone, they're a heretic. They're in a heresy. They're part of a cult. Whatever. You love that person. You try to give them the gospel. Because that's what we're there for. So you give them an admonition. You tell them why they're wrong. You show them scriptures. They're believing heresy. You say, no, no, no. Here's what the Bible teaches. And you show that to them. Meekly and humbly. In sincerity. Because you love them. You want them to get saved. They don't accept that. They go, no, 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 but what about this verse? Because, you know, you always, you get easy to get involved in this tit for tat, right? They say, you say, well, hey, look, the Bible says clearly right here it's everlasting life. They say, well, what about this verse? Say, okay. And they, they don't even ever respond to your actual point that you're making. They say, well, what about this verse? So you say, okay, I'll explain this verse to you. And you give the explanation. Well, what about this verse? Right? And you could just get on this whole thing of just going back and forth where you're presenting verses and they're just saying, well, what about this verse? You can't answer those questions all day because they're not trying, they don't care about learning or understanding or even acknowledging the truth. They just want to hold to their doctrine so tight they're just going to come up with any other verse that they can just to, just to win the argument and not acknowledge that what they're saying then is that they're believing in contradictions because they could see what you're saying but they're not acknowledging the truth. So if they're not going to acknowledge the truth, when you can show them, you give them one admonition, you give them two admonitions, and then you say, bye-bye. See you later. Because we don't want to get involved in these arguments. And you, look, you got to understand that they're subverted. They're in sin. They're condemned of themselves. And if they don't want to hear the truth, then it's on them. You've given them the opportunity. You give them two, op two opportunities to listen you know what? Someone else will give you, well, won't even reject it the first time. So go find that person then. Now, there may be some people you run into that you're having a good discussion with and they're not necessarily agreeing with you, but they're not rejecting either. Right? They're not just rejecting the first and second admonition, but they're, they're asking more. I spend time with those people. But this is, again, a judgment call that you have to learn on how much time you want to invest in somebody. Because I'll invest, look, if it's going to take someone 12 hours to get saved, 
it's worth the time investment. If they're going to get saved, it's worth the time investment. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, of course it is. Of course it is. Now, you don't always know how long it's going to take, but the, the, the way that you can tell if you're making progress with someone is if they're hearing what you have to say and if, and if you're getting them to be able to accept so, at least some of the things that you're showing them. then I don't feel like that's a big waste of time because you're actually making progress with that person and they're open to... Because if you're not able to show them anything, they're not going to receive anything. And, and you just need to get out of there. And that's why after the, you, you, give, you give it a couple of shots and if it's just not working, then you, you go. Um, so we need to avoid the arguments. Another thing that we need to do and we need to remember when we go out soul winning and this is kind of on the flip side, is we need to be bold. We need to be bold. Acts chapter 4. Actually, turn if you would to Romans chapter 1. Turn if you would to Romans 1. Acts 4 verse 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, the difference between being bold and being a jerk, as I mentioned before, we don't want to be a jerk and condescending and just talking down to people. However, you do have the truth, you do have the gospel, and you can be bold. And we ought to be bold and not back down, as it were, on, on the truth. In this situation, in the context of what we're reading here, Peter and John were being confronted by the Pharisees and these rulers and stuff, and, and they're saying, no, this is the truth. And they're, they're boldly proclaiming it regardless of what the consequences might be to them giving the message. Bold means there's no fear involved. It doesn't, it doesn't mean they're being jerks and they're talking down to people. It just means that they're not afraid. And when we go soul winning, we can't be afraid. You can't be afraid of crime. You can't be afraid of just whatever. You can't bring fear when you go out and preach the gospel. And don't let people get you afraid. Um, one way that people might try to scare you off is by telling you that, oh, you, you're not allowed to be here. Oh, there's no soliciting. You can't be here. Do you have permission to be here? If anyone ever asks you if you have permission to be somewhere, just say yes. Because they're expecting you to say no. Say yes. I do have permission. You don't have to elaborate on it at all. And the best way to deal with people who are just trying to harass you and, and to get you scared and to get you to run away is to just be just very short with them. You don't need to spend a lot of time with them. Don't let them waste your time. Yep, I have permission. Or if someone even says, hey, don't you know you're not supposed to be just listening here? It's okay, I got permission. You know who gave us permission? God did when he commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature. They may not recognize that authority, but you know what? God does have that authority, so we can recognize that. And you don't have to elaborate to them. You have to explain all the details to them. It doesn't even matter. You've got permission to be there. God wants you to be there. So there you go. And, and that should be enough comfort for you to not worry about it. Look, we ought not to be worried. What can this world do? Was, were Peter and John worried that the, they might get arrested? That they might get the cops called on them? That they might get thrown in prison? I understand for a newer believer especially, but even for some older believers, that you, you may start to get fear if someone says, hey, I'm going to call the cops on you. You better leave right now or I'm calling the cops. Now, we don't go out trying and intending to get the cops called on us. Obviously, that's, again, that's not the goal. We're not going out to get arrested. That's not what we're, we're trying to do. But we're also going to go out and be bold. We're going to preach the gospel. Now, this is a very important point. When, uh, when it comes to no soliciting signs on someone's door, the rule here is going to be you can choose how to deal with that how you'd like to. That's the rule. 
I give, I give the soul winners a lot of freedom on doing what you think is right in a given situation. And you know what? I will back you up. If you're going out preaching the gospel, do you have to worry about anyone, you know, complaining or coming back to, to me or the church or anything like that? I'll back you up. If you're going out and preaching the gospel, no matter what, I'll back you up. If you're, I mean, unless you're like hopping someone's barbed wire fence and they've got no trespassing all around and you're still trying to get in front, you know what? <laughs> I like your zeal, but, you know, I'm not necessarily, you know, you know and, and if you're arrested, I'll still bail you out. All right, how about that? I'd still bail you out for that. I'd still be your friend. But, um, but it, it would be foolish to do that. And, and I don't think anyone here would do that anyways. But um, when it comes to those signs, you know, treat it how you'd like to your own, you know, I'm not going to try to get you to do something that you think you shouldn't do. But I'll tell you right now, I don't believe that you have to, I, I, first of all, I don't believe that we're soliciting anyways. I don't believe that we're soliciting when, if someone says no soliciting, we are not selling anything. We're not trying to get them to sign anything. We're not trying to sway their political persuasion. We're not doing any of that stuff. We are simply bringing them the gospel of Jesus Christ for their, for their soul to be saved. It's a free gift. The, the way that I like to, the analogy I like to use is if someone were to knock on your door and say, I've got a million dollars in cash as a gift for you. Would you like that gift? Would you consider that solicitation? Because if you don't consider that solicitation, then you can't consider what we're doing solicitation either. Because we're offering something even better than a million dollars in cash. It's the salvation of their soul. And they can accept that gift or not. And we're just pointing them, hey, there's a gift right there. Or what if I said, hey, there's a, you know, am I soliciting if I say, hey, there's a bag of cash just, just on your doorstep right around the corner over there. It's up to you if you want to go and get it or not. You know, it's the same thing. We're not soliciting. We're not selling anything. If people come, but however, if people come out and say, don't you see the sign? Can't you read? And they're upset. Okay, see you later. Have a good day. Well, I said, well, we're just inviting people to church. You know, I'm not going to get in a big debate and discussion on why what we're doing is okay. If they're already irritated and upset, I'm just going to go. I may say something like, well, you know, I'm sorry. We're not, we're not really soliciting. No, we're just, we're just trying to invite people to church. We're just trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, just in case they don't have a wrong impression of why we're there. Maybe they think that we are actually trying to sell something. You know, I'll, I'll at least try to put some words out there, but I'm not going to waste time and debate with them over why we can be there. I'm not going to debate the, the laws that say, even in this country, I'd say we have a right to practice our, you know, we have a right of religious freedom, which, by the way, it's important to understand that too, that even in apartment complexes and other places, you cannot just be kicked out legally. I mean, you have a right to be there to practice your faith and to preach the gospel. You have a right to do that. So, you know, there's, and again, if you, if you really care and want to get into the legal reasons, you actually do have the right for that. When it comes to no trespassing, here's, here's one where I will, and, and you can do what you want with this again, just like the no soliciting thing, do what you want. I don't think it's not, I don't think it's right to not knock the doors of the no soliciting personally. But you can make that judgment call for yourself. You know, again, no one's watching you. Whatever, do what you want to do. If you're if you're uncomfortable doing it, then I, I mean, whatever. But um, but I want to know if there's doors that aren't being knocked at least, so we can go back and, and someone else can do them. But I'd rather have you out there knocking some doors than no doors. Uh, the no trespassing ones. I've had two different types of experiences with no trespassing. One is people will put them on their fence or on their gate in kind of a higher crime area because they don't want criminals coming into their backyard or hanging out or like loitering like on their property like in a ghetto but they don't care if you come to their door or knock on their door because that sign is meant more towards like people committing criminal acts and like hopping through their yard and doing stuff like that but i've also had the experience and i haven't seen it out here yet but in prescott valley there's some people who like post signs 
all over and will like lock their gates and do all this stuff to try to keep people out. The way that I use that is if that's the way that they want to be, they've made up their mind already, then we'll just have to meet that person somewhere else. If someone is just really serious about wanting you to know that they don't want you coming on their property at all, I view that as saying, you know what, they're just gonna, they, they will just be upset anyways. Because I've gone on the properties before and every single time without fail, people that are really like that adamant about it, they're not gonna listen to what you have to say anyways. I look at that as just a waste of time then and just causing strife for no reason and I will pass up those doors personally. But again, you do what you wanna do. You got, if, you, if you think that you, you know I'm gonna go and do it anyways, fine, go ahead. And, and if you think, you know, I look at that as they've made up their mind already. A no soliciting sign, I mean, people have those up all over the place. And I think half the people don't even realize the sign's there. I think like someone puts a sign up at some point and then people like move houses and other people move in, everything else, and the sign just stays up and it's just like, whatever. Most of the time, people don't even bring up the no soliciting sign when it's there. No trespassing I've, is a little bit different. Now, you still have many times where people know you know, not, that one's a little bit harder to pin down into words and really give a good explanation. But again, use your own uh, judgment on that. Now, I, I had to turn to Romans 1.16. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This has to go, this goes back to the, just the point of being bold. Right? Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't let anyone shame you for doing what you're doing. Don't let anyone shame you for being at the doorstep. Um, be bold. And then finally, we need to be wise. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, when it comes to wisdom, There's a few things I want to bring up here. And these are pretty important, so just, just pay attention for this. We're almost done. These are, these are very important points, so these last few points. We need to be accountable and have a level of accountability. So the same way that you know, I try to have a level of accountability with the finances here, I have other people counting up the money and they both sign off on it and there's accountability so that there's no, no funny business going on, no one's stealing cash, right? Well, in the same way, when we go out to people's houses, we need to be accountable. This is another one of the benefits of having two people there so you have two witnesses of everything that happens as opposed to just being by yourself. It's more wise to have soul winning partners than to go by yourself. I'm not against soul winning by yourself. I've done it plenty of times, but it's just more wise. It's a better practice to be in the habit of, of having at least two people there to give a testimony because especially when people who hate God want to lie about you or about something that you did and they're going to call the cops and they're going to say, oh, this person did this and they did that and they damaged my property or they would and they want to like harass you and bring a lawsuit against you. Well, if you have two witnesses... At least you can say, no, this is the truth. And there's two of us that say the same thing and that person's lying about us. Right? It's going to give you just more leverage, more, not, not even just leverage, it's just, it's, just a, it's a good idea. It'll give you another testimony. Um, so we want to be wise. And along with that, if you, do, if you are by yourself and someone invites you into their house, don't go into their house, especially... Now, you, I mean, you make the judgment call for yourself. It's like, let's say you're a guy and you're going to, to, to someone's door and it's another guy and they invite you into their house. Use your discretion. I'd be careful about that. I mean, often I've never had a problem personally, but if you're a man and a woman answers the door and they invite you into their house, say, no, thank you, ma'am. I'm okay standing right here. You do not want to put yourself in a situation where someone could say something and it's behind closed doors. Oh, this person said they're from this church, but when they came in, they did this and they did that, like with Joseph. Right? We have a biblical example of this happening. Potiphar's wife coming on to Joseph and then lying about him and all the, the world of trouble that he got in, even though he didn't do anything wrong. You don't want to give an opportunity like something to that to ever be said about you. 
don't allow yourself. I mean, if there's multiple people in the house, that's a little bit different. But if it's just like, you're, or especially if you're a woman and someone invites you into the house, I would just say no. No, thank you. Now, if you're there with a partner, if you, if you have a soul-winning partner, again, you've got more accountability, there's more safety, there's two of you at least, you know, that's not as big of a deal. But make sure you're using wisdom and discretion when a situation like this arises. I mean, there's, there's friendly people. I've had plenty of friendly people invite me into their house, and like I said, nothing's ever happened, but we still want to be wise because we're being sent forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. There are wolves out there, and we need to be aware of that. Now, another point where we need to demonstrate wisdom is speaking with children. Okay, dealing with children. What do you do? And I'm going to tell you the way I want things to be done in this church as not only representative of Jesus Christ, but as representative of Stronghold Baptist Church. Okay, and I'm pretty firm on this. I like to treat people with the same amount of respect that I would like to be treated with. Okay? I understand that we have the gospel and we, have, we know what the truth is and we're going to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, but, but when it comes to little kids, if I found somebody trying to proselytize any of my children, because so my oldest is eight, I'm going to be very angry and upset at some adults, especially if they come to my house and my daughter answers the door and they start trying to proselytize my daughter at eight years old. I'm going to be very upset about that. So here's the way that I deal with children when we're out soul winning. And this is the way I'd like things to be done here. First of all, if there are children out in public, just out in the street, out in the world. And there's no parents around, there's no guardian, there's no adults. I don't have a problem with approaching them with the gospel. If you're not in an air, you know, I mean, if, if they're going to leave them just out, just way out in the world to themselves, then I will preach the gospel to them. I don't have a problem with that. Because if, if nobody's watching over them at all and they're not in a place that should be considered safe like their home or their residence, then I will, I will preach the gospel to some kids. But when I go to someone's house, whether they're inside the house or just on their property and it looks like it's their house, I'm not going to give that child the gospel. The first thing you do is ask, is your mom or dad home? Hey, is your mom or dad home? And if mom and dad is there, great, you deal with mom and dad. Mom and dad don't want to hear the gospel. Hey, can I, can I give your kids a Bible story? Can I tell them a story about Jesus? You get permission from the parents to do so. And then if they allow you to, great. But they're not at an age where they're going to be able to consent with you on wanting to hear stuff when, you know, when their parents are responsible for them. So if they're in a place where, where they're at home, Right? We're not going to go and just start, because here's what's going to happen. Even though you say, yeah, but you know, kids are so receptive and they hear God, I understand that, but you're going to be giving off a really bad, a really bad impression of who we are and what we do. So, I mean, when the parents come home or whatever, you know, and bring up a bad report of us just targeting kids. And, and dealing with minors that just, you know, say, hey, they're impressionable. They, there's nothing, you know, they've got no one there to help them out. Now, um, when it comes to, there's obviously a certain range of ages where I also deal with kids differently as well. Because I'm talking about the younger kids. Seven, eight, nine, five, you know, whatever. Like, the, I, we're not going to mess with that. But you knock on a door and there's a teenager home, right? Someone's old. Someone could think for themselves. Someone that, that, that obviously has some mental capacity. They've been taught already by their parents. They should know what's right or wrong. And, some, and oftentimes, those are going to be the most likely ones you'll find left home alone anyways because they're old enough for the parents to look at them and be like, okay, they could handle themselves. So if they answer the door, I ask for mom and dad still first. 
mom and dad don't come, aren't, aren't home, what I'll usually do then with someone who's, who's older, I'll ask them, hey, I'm out in the neighborhood. We're inviting people to Baptist Church, so I'd like you to be able to at least give this to your parents. You know, if they don't open the door, that's fine. I'll just leave this on the door for you. And I'll say, we're also asking everyone if they know for sure they're saved and go to heaven. And I'll say, I'd like to tell you about that, explain that to you. Would your parents be okay if I were to explain that to you, if I were able to show you some stuff from the Bible? Would you, would you want to hear that, and would they be okay with that? Because they should be at the age to be able to tell whether or not they know if their parents are going to be upset that someone's coming to their door and talking to them about this or not. And I'll, and I'll kind of deal with it that way. A, a young kid... You can't trust them to be able to answer that question correctly. Because I, e I don't even know, like I would hope that my kids would know the right answer. But they may not have the right answer because someone, you know, it's an adult and they might just be like, okay, yeah, and just go along with it. But someone who's like a teenager, they should know better. Those are the instances that I'll use. Like I said, if they're, if they're out and about and just left themselves and they're just off at a park or you're out in public somewhere, I, th I call that fair game. But when they're at home, you always ask for the parents, you get the parents' permission and do it that way. And that's the way I'd like to see things done here. Um, we don't want to be, have it even said about us that we target young kids and we do things in a way that's underhanded or with guile or deceitful or anything like that. Everything we do should be above board, and that's the, the reasoning for that. Now, um, the last couple of things I'm going to bring up here, we need to obviously be thorough with the gospel. We're not into this one, two, three, repeat after me stuff. You better be spending time explaining the gospel, explaining who Jesus is, explaining death, burial, resurrection, explain eternal security, explain, you know, every single point, the points that we have in the back of those cards there, explain those, make sure people understand it before you get to the point of um, praying with them. And when it comes down to counting salvations, first of all, when we are telling them up, and again, this isn't the most important thing at all, when it just comes to our record keeping. The actual process of, you know, in doing the soul winning is way more important. But when it comes to, to counting the salvations, one, I don't count anyone as being saved if they don't pray. So if someone says, oh, I'll pray later, I'll pray when I go inside, great, I hope they do. We don't count that as a salvation. Okay, even if they say that they believed everything, because usually a reason why people doesn't, don't want to pray is because they don't actually believe it. It's easier for them to lie to you and say they believe it than it is for them to actually open up their mouth and pray to God and tell God, yes, I believe all these things. That's not always the case, but you know what? It doesn't matter. We're going we're gonna to be very conservative with our numbers. We want people you know, to consider them as being saved if they actually pray. And also, if you, don't, if you have any doubts in your mind about it, if they're saying, well, you know, I kind of gave them the gospel. I think they understood it, you know, but they were kind of hung up on this. They're kind of hung up on that. And I never really felt like, I don't know if they ever really got it. I prayed with them and they prayed the prayer, but there was still a lot of hang-ups. I'm not quite sure if they got it. Then don't count them. We're not trying to impress people with numbers. We're not trying to show off and say, oh, I got this many people saved. It's a good motivation. We keep, we keep track of the salvations because it's good to keep us going. It's good to have goals. It's good to try to reach people. But at the end of the day, we want to be as close as possible. Just to, If anything, maybe we'll have more salvations, right? And that would be great. Praise God. More people were saved than we actually counted, but we want to try to be as sure as we can about the numbers that we count that they are saved. So those are some practical tips. There's a lot more we could get into. Obviously, there's a lot of things involved. Hopefully, if there is anything that you are unsure about, this clears it up. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, please see me after the service. I'd be more than happy to um, discuss these things in further detail. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for the um, principles that we can learn from your word and, and apply to our soul winning. God, I pray that you would please help us to win as many people to Christ as we possibly can. Lord, I pray that you please help us continually to analyze our, our soul winning, our style, what we do, the things that we say, the examples that we use, and just um, all the methods that we use, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us not to be offensive to people before we even get an opportunity to preach the gospel. I pray that you please help us to learn tact 
and the things that we say to people that we wouldn't just um, cause them to not hear the gospel when otherwise they would just based on something that, that we do, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us um, as we, we have a love for, for the lost and we want them to get saved. And God, just refine us and, and use us to be the best instruments that we could possibly be to get people saved. In Jesus' name we pray.